Okay. So once again, hi everyone. This is GitLab's first GSOC demo call. Uh, we have four interns here who are going to demo their work from the summer. Um, let's get started. Who'd like to start? Serene, Alejandro, or Anshuman? Okay, Alejandro, let's start with you. Oh, sure, I go start, no problem. Let me share my screen because I created some slides beforehand. Uh, next up, no, there we go. Boop. Does it look okay on your end? Great. Okay, let's get, let's get started with Coursera's code. So our idea was to make GitLab friendlier to educators because GitLab, like, just by using GitLab, you could handle all of your coursework, um, up, upload it there, you automatically gain version control, files with with the case of some uh, used files used to get shared with emails or USB drives and then get lost once the educator leaves the organization, lose all of those classes, all of that content, all of those changes. I mean, changes are not recorded using e emails or USB drives, but they are when you use version control. And you will also gain the ability to have both educators and students collaborate using merge requests. A student will just like need to create a merge request, add new content, fix some some exercise that was that was wrong, and it will be that easy. Both educators and students could collaborate and use all of GitLab services because GitLab user offers tons of services, right? Like GitLab pages, you can easily host your contents of your class. GitLab API, you could automate um lots of boring stuff for classes like creating projects sharing projects with your students um and gitlab webhooks you will create custom responses to events of your students so if your student just finish up an issue or just push up push some code you could like create a response to that but the problem is that they all require a certain technical knowledge like for GitLab page, for example, you need to know where it's going to be hosted, what's your base URL. I get tripped up on it, uh, to be honest, as well. And, and I, I know how to code a little bit at least. It took me a little while to create my first GitLab page and get it working and get, have it a, give it a custom theme. And the same goes to, to an API. An API, you, you need to know how to code at least, how to make an API defines some certain action if it fails. And webhooks are even even more complicated, right? Because what's even a webhook? What can I do with it? And how do I listen to webhooks, right? How do I create an application that's constantly listening to webhooks and, and changes and events what, and to create a response to that? So the solution is Coursera's code. We created three projects, like they are three completely separate um, repositories that handled these problems. The first we started with was Courseware template for easily creating GitLab pages. We created Courseware tools for automating boring processes using OP calls. And we created Courseware bot for automatic responses to the, to the progress of the students. The, the, so the philosophy behind Courseware's code is that it should be easy to use for everyone. Assume nothing of the technical background of the user they could be an experienced programmer or they could be a, a professor from teaching biology, teaching something completely different. You, 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 don't, you don't need to have to be teaching computer science or software engineering to use Casper code. That's, that's its main purpose. And every, every step for spinning up Coursera's code should be documented and should be documented in the most clear way possible. Again, assuming nothing of the technical background. And of course, instead of installing everything locally and installing, I don't know, Ruby, installing Python, installing different stuff, just make it as easy as possible to run. Run locally using Docker. Or use also, we, we tried out Gitpod for spinning up like a web service and and then using Docker there. That's that's super useful. Or with GitLab CI C D. Like just run a pipeline and run our code and run everything that that's that's needed to, to do it. And for each for each project, uh, when it comes to Coursera template, 
it's actually a git uh, a shakel a shakel template for hosting the content of your class using GitLab pages and uses just the docs as its default theme. The thing is that again there is a certain technical background and technical knowledge you need to start using it, uh, GitLab pages and give it a custom theme and know how to add content and stuff like that. So we made it a little bit easier by modif by there is no need to modify its configs. When you first start a Shackle project, you have to get into the config, understand what's the base URL, understand what is, what's its URL, understand different things that are all incredibly well documented on the documentation of GitLab pages, but they require like some extra steps. They require some extra effort. And maybe someone with no technical knowledge will give up at that point if they have to take, like, I don't know, try, try stuff for one hour, two hours until it works and they understand it. We uh, try to make it easier by using the variables from GitLab CI CD. So you automatically start consuming those variables and there is no need to use that config to modify the config manually. Since it's consuming the variables from the pipeline, it knows its base URL, it knows the name of the project. So there is no need to modify it. And there's some stuff that's actually hard in Shackle, but it doesn't seem like hard, but it, it ends up being hard, like attacking, attaching files and stuff like that. So we created plugins to make that easy as well. Um, and also we created some new functionalities. So like adding slides, all of them written in Markdown and interactive quizzes that you can do inside the template. When it comes to Corsair tools, well, that's what we talked about before that it's does a lot of AP calls to automatically assign to automatically give assignments via GitLab to your students instead of like creating the project manually for each student and making sure they have the correct rights and that they have the correct permissions to do stuff. Just run this, <laughs> run your run our pipeline, run our script, and adds all of your all of your students from your group gives them their own unique repository, making sure that they are as developers and educators are as admins. And you will be sharing your assignments using GitLab issues. Uh, this, this will give us the ability to write, as well as giving them coding assignments to learn the good practices of working with issues, working with merge, merge requests, and having, having someone to call review their code. And last, we have course robot. So check the progress of, the, of your student by listening to webhooks of the projects. This one, you will need to deploy it somewhere. Heroku, I mean, it's a really simple script that's, that's, that's listening to your webhooks. So a free instance is good enough for, for a small class or for a medium-sized class. Using Heroku or AWS, that will work. And it's constantly listening to the webhooks made at the repositories of your students, and its response grants them custom badges. So once they finish up an issue, they will like recognize that the issue is closed, and then grant the student a badge congratulating them on their progress. And that's it. No more slides. Um, I guess our next step of Coursera's code is get people to use it and get people to check it out and change it and fork it and modify them in whatever way they want. That, that, that's our, our next step. Cool. Um, thanks a lot, Alejandro. That's a lot of uh, interesting information. I can see how it would be easy to create courseware like this, especially now that um, we are in a time of more and more online education. I can see how this can be very useful. Cool, thanks a lot. Um, does anybody have any very quick questions or should we move on to the next next one? Okay, next one. Uh, Serene, do you wanna go next? Okay, I will share my screen. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I will be presenting the project Port Sest and Secret Detection Rails Platform Code to GitLab CE, which I worked on with the security. 
So first of all, in project context, I will uh, make a brief uh, overview of GitLab's distribution and vulner vulnerability management features in order to better understand this project. Next, in realization, we will talk a bit about the challenges that uh, I faced and the solutions that made it possible to overcome them, as well as the migration path that we followed throughout the implementation and my mentee experience. We'll finish this presentation with a conclusion and perspective. So as you all know, we have uh, two GitLab distributions, Enterprise Edition and Community Edition. Community Edition is open source and contains uh, the core code for uh, GitLab. And the Enterprise Edition uses that same core and builds on top of it, adding other features. Uh, both of these distributions, uh, all development work for them is realized on one single code base, which is the GitLab Enterprise edition code base. And the way this works is that we have another repository called GitLab Force that mirrors the GitLab enterprise uh, code base without the slash EE directory. And that way we get the GitLab community distribution. GitLab is a uh, preferred tool for numerous open source projects. And this is in part thanks to its vulnerability management features. GitLab has uh, many uh, different uh, tire vulnerability management features like issue management, which is uh, available in the community edition, approval merge request, which is uh, a premium feature and so only available in the enterprise edition and security scanning tools, which is what we are really interested on in for this project, which is uh, an ultimate future and only available in the enterprise edition too. Among these security scanning tools, this project's uh, focus is on SAST and secret detection. SAST and secret detection are ultimate features, uh, but uh, as part of GitLab commitment to open source, we want to move them to the core and make them available uh, in the community edition. The reason that we want to move SAS and secret detection is because uh, security reports are uh, a very powerful tool, especially for uh, open source projects. And um, so making uh, it possible for users in community edition to visualize uh, the vulnerab their vulnerabilities will help them a lot. One thing to keep in mind though, is that we only want users in community edition to be able to visualize uh, the vulnerabilities, but not to be able to manage them. So first of all, uh, one big challenge was uh, getting familiar with a big and complex code base like GitLab. Uh, there was a large amount of intercomponent dependencies and because community edition initially almost had no features, it, uh, and so the repartition between what should go to CE and what should stay in EE wasn't really obvious. It wasn't possible to uh, decide from the get-go what uh, all the target classes and methods to move would be. And I was also worried that um, uh, I would move too many files or that any changes I would make could break something or cause any issues in the future. So the way uh, that... Uh, we overcame these challenges was by first uh, making an analysis of the dependency structure and so understanding uh, the two types of de dependencies that existed, which are di data dependencies uh, between the definition and user values, call dependencies between the declaration of functions and the sites where they are called, and merging and consolidating similar or identical methods helped in uh, diminishing the impact uh, of these dependencies. Uh, because uh, the, the work in this project, it couldn't really be done in uh, parallel. It couldn't be uh, divided in a way that you could do uh, many steps at the same time, or um, there weren't, wasn't really uh, a way to separate the work into uh, steps without them being connected, because everything depends on the step that is before it. So uh, we made all changes in specific branches uh, that were later merged and then uh, the next step would be um, related to that branch. And because I was afraid that my changes uh, would 
break something or create any issues, the pipeline test served as a great uh, gate check. To also make sure that I wouldn't be moving anything that should not be moved to CE, we named three guiding principles. The first is that everything that is involved in showing the SAS and secret detection security reports results should be moved to CE. Second, everything that is involved in managing the vulnerability findings should stay in EE. And third, when a file or model is used for both, uh, I should then segment by feature first and information architecture second. With that done, we divided the work into three phases. Each phase uh, concerns moving one of the main models that would be necessary to be able to use the SAS and secret detection features in CE. The first phase concerned moving Boros and the security merge report service. The second phase, uh, the vulnerability reports compare. And the third fa phase, the security report service. Throughout the coding period, I was able to complete phase one and phase two. Phase three uh, was uh, blocked because of a pipeline licensing check tests, and uh, it would need uh, more time to see where, uh, what, where, what exactly is causing it and how to fix that. So all in all, the work amounted to four more merge requests. These merge requests all had very uh, varying number of file changes because at certain times, a single file can have many dependencies and also be the dependency of many other files. And so it couldn't just change that file, it had also to change the other files and uh, make any uh, adaptations in, in the way uh, the logic uh, of it functions. To get a better idea of what kind of work exactly went into this, I will show a bit of uh, that merge request. So as I said earlier, it wasn't really possible to know from the start what will be uh, moved and what won't be moved. And so in a lot of cases, every file needed to be treat, uh, treated on a case by case basis, depending on what kind of dependencies it has, data dependencies or call dependencies, what other files depend on it and where it fits in the whole um, structure. Uh, either uh, sometimes either had to merge existing monkey patches uh, like in here or uh, in other cases, create monkey, uh, new monkey patches. There's also uh, cases where moving this, uh, the file was uh, uh, all it took, but then uh, in many cases too, uh, there were lines and other files that had to be changed. And I could only know about them when I run through the pipeline tests and see a lot of bugs. And then after looking into why these errors are happening, can we know uh, what else needs to be moved or what else needed to be changed? So going back here, all in all, we have 79 file changes for phase one and phase two. And thankfully, uh, these all these four merge requests that were merged successfully. Throughout every step, my three mentors, Tatiana, Lucas, and Adam, were all highly involved. And anytime I felt stuck or confused about something or needed help, they were quick to respond and explain things very detailedly, be it my message or through a video call. Uh, I think it's important that I mention this because on my own, I don't think I would have, I think I would have been still stuck in the first magic quest and trying to figure out what is happening in the pipeline? Why is it not working? Why is it working? <laughs> so to list some of the uh, some of the help that I received uh, from the very start when I was installing the environment on my PC, my PC couldn't really handle it. I don't know if this was the case for other uh, interns or not, but I feel like uh, GitLab is very uh, uh, is very uh, needs a lot of. Uh, performance from a PC. And so Tatiana helped me um, figure out a way to make to make um, to make it less uh, to make it 
possible to work on my PC without giving up on me. <laughs> and despite our uh, big time difference, Adam was always available for any questions I had. And uh, with Lucas, we always had uh, uh, calls and in a lot of times we'd have hour long calls to help me debug, debug errors and explain anything from GitLab architecture to how to use binding prime. So despite how challenging this project was, thanks to the guidance and help I received, I had a very fun and enriching experience. We finally reached the conclusion and perspective. I've learned a lot through this project. I have a better understanding of Ruby, SPEC, and behavior development, uh, driven development in general. I've learned a lot about the work that goes in maintaining an open source project, merge request workflows, the importance of automated tests, and how open source projects evolve and the effect of it on its architecture, as well as uh, the effect of past architectural decisions on what can and cannot be done later on. I'd say that this project is 85% completed. The uh, work that is left to do is in phase three, uh, which is also in a very advanced state. And I think that once we can figure out how to unblock the uh, license check issue, uh, it will be uh, ready to, to be reviewed and ho hopefully merged. <laughs> and that was all. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. If anyone has any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Thank you. That is a terrific presentation. Um, such a nice deep look into the work you all have been putting in. And I have to say, I loved your diagrams in the beginning of the presentation. Um, it is quite a challenge to understand how our code is divided. It is for all of us when we uh, start GitLab, so I can completely relate with that. Amazing to hear about the mentors as well. So great job. Uh, Thank does anybody you. have quick questions or we can move to the next one? Okay, nobody, I guess. Cool. Uh, let's go with Anshuman next. Uh, thank you. So um, Julian will be presenting with the motivation of the project and then I will be diving into the technical parts. So first of all, to, the, to Julian. Oh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to shortly uh, give an overview of the project's project context. So I will just quickly share my screen. Um, yeah, so um, our project was about write, writing vulnerability detection rules um, and um, if you're interested, I shared just the slides in the chat, you can uh, follow follow along. So um, if you're interested in the proposal and planning epic, you can find more details on the uh, linked issues. Um, so I um, assume that most of you um, have already seen the vulnerability report, which is a feature that enables you to basically go through the different vulnerabilities and to act on them. So um, you can think of the vulnerability report as a sort of kitchen sink where uh, the reports from different security analyzers is collected and um, viewed. So for example, here you can see in this uh, screenshot, you can see some um, results from static analysis scanners and you can click on them and then you can, you basically redirect it to the code locations where the vulnerability is located and then, then you can act um, upon them. Um, and the, um, you can imagine that there's a number of different SAS tools that are integrated and that are providing results, which are all collected on this um, page. Um, and this is like a maintenance burden. Um, so the, one of the problems is that um, there's a lot of these, these scanners, they're regularly changing. So these are open source scanners that are maintained by other people um, from in the open source community. There are regular updates that are coming in. So you can imagine that we have to basically pull in the updates locally to our wrappers that we make them available on gitlab.com. Um, and which basically means that we have to monitor what's going, what's happening upstream uh, on the upstream repositories on these analyzers on a regular basis. Um, another problem is that we cannot impact these analyzers. So um, because they are maintained by other teams, um, it's hard to kind of impact the results of these, of these scanners um, without basically contributing upstreams, which is also a lengthy process. Um, so that basically motivated the replacement of many SAS tools. So the static analysis team is uh, basically replacing many of these like, different static analysis tools that we have with, um, with one single tool called SAMCRAP, which is a language agnostic uh, scanner that you can configure, um, and which basically means that we um, replace a plethora of different scanners like 
uh, basically 15 different scanners with ideally 15 scanners with a single one, um, reducing the maintenance effort um, on our end. Um, but the problem is that the replacement itself is a challenging process because um, you, you cannot simply replace an, a scanner without making sure that uh, the replacement goes unnoticed. So you don't want customers to be upset that analyzes the, 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 the results don't show, show up again, uh, um, or there's, there may be even historical data that users already acted upon but that you don't want to be lost. Um, and uh, this uh, replacement process was basically the, the core of, of this whole GSOC project. Um, we wanted to make sure that the transition from the original analyzers that are integrated to ZEMCRIP to the single analyzer is as smooth as possible. Um, so that we needed a certain level of Q&A on the configuration of ZEMCRIP to make sure that it behaves exactly the same as the analyzers that we are going to replace. Um, so um, uh, now per our definition, we said that a good quality wood set, a good quality configuration of ZEMCRIP um, is expected to perform at least as good as the analyzer that we aim to replace. So it should have zero gaps in full parity. Um, and uh, based on that, we had a, a set of project objectives and deliverables. Um, the first deliverable was a testing framework that enables us to test our ZEMCRIP configuration um, so that it behaves exactly the same as the analyzers that we are um, going to replace. Uh, then we wanted to store this configuration for ZEMCRIP at the central place, the GitLab rule repository. And um, the idea was that whenever we change the rule in this repository, it triggers a CI pipeline, it basically invokes the testing framework to apply the testing automatically. Um, and another goal was to replace at least one analyzer that we have in our case, Flow Finder, which is the analyzer, the SAS tool for C, C++ with the corresponding root set. And this basically frames the motivation of this project and why um, um, it's important for VR and uh, static analysis. And uh, with that, I am handing over to Anshuman. I think you are muted. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, thank you, Julian. I hope you can see my screen. So, yeah, so um, uh, what Julian shared with you was all the motivation part, the what and why of the project, why it's needed and all those things. Uh, in the upcoming slides, I will be giving you an overview of all the technical details and what exactly has been done regarding that whole motivation part. So the, the basically what we have done is we have divided our whole project into two main parts. The very first is the GitLab tool repository and the second is the testing framework. So the first, the GitLab tool repository, what actually it is. Um, it's actually a project or a repository where all the analyzers which we are translating into SimGrip, their corresponding rule sets and the corresponding test cases do exist there. So in this slide, if you can see, I would like you to tension over here. So you can see the whole structure of the GitLab rule repository. For each analyzer, I mean, for each language, we have corresponding rules and their corresponding test cases. Uh, for JavaScript, we have the same. For Python, we have the same. And what we have done is we to ensure some uniformity in the rules which we have created over the uh, past few weeks. Uh, we have enforced some uniformity guidelines as well, such as, for example, you must, must have an apostrophe, uh, no collapsing of array elements, uh, the maximum line, line length should not exceed more than 100 characters, some, uh, indentation, and most importantly, what we have included is the CWE information so that whenever the particular rule set is run over a test case or the code base of a user, the user will get to do that this particular vulnerability was found in his or her whole code base. Uh, but in addition to that, these rules and test cases which we created, there is an important thing, this mappings file. So the mappings file, uh, this actually plays a main part in the testing framework. So, uh, but I would, uh, I want to give you an idea of what actually it is. Uh, it is used to, you know, map the original IDs which exist in the original analyzer to the IDs which we have created using the simple tool sets. And it helps us to do the gap analysis to identify the possible gaps which may exist in this whole translation into simple. Uh, on this slide, what you can see is the gap analysis 
uh, which we are enforcing through the GitLab CI configuration. Uh, as you can see here as well, that uh, we are enforcing those tests on the root sets which we have created that uh, the YAML that should be there. Uh, every view which has been created, it should have a unique ID. It should, valid it should be validated by SimGrip. Uh, rule check quality and availability by those community guidelines and the following map file to exist or not. And then we initiate a gap analysis. And what it does is it turns the whole testing framework, which uh, I will be telling you in the upcoming slides, uh, which tells us if there is any gap in this whole translation process. So, you know, one of the most important parts which we need to understand is that. Uh, the analyzers which we are translating into SimWeb, they are there in the market for a long time. And the users have been using them for a long time as well. So what we need is a potential replacement, a replacement which must be reliable, which the users must can rely upon. So this testing framework is a whole structure kind of thing, which in the very end gives us a markdown output, which tells us that yes, this tool set was covered by the original analyzer as well, and by the analyzer which we have so this is the whole uh, kind of flow chart, which you can see. So the main parts are the GitLab root repository. And for each analyzer, like for Bandit, if you translate it to Android, for Flow Finder, we have a corresponding CI job uh, where this whole comparison thing is going on. And then in the very end, you have a markdown output. So how does it work? We'll come in the uh, next slides. Uh, the whole gap analysis, how do we do it? So the first thing which we do is these test cases, which do reside in the central root repository, we source these test cases, and then we run the original analyzer over these test cases and the SimGrip uh, rule sets which we have created, and then we obtain the GL SAS report. Then what we do is we compare these two GL SAS reports uh, generated by the original analyzer and by SimGrip using a uh, functional a tool basically which we created using Ruby which is named as record diff and then uh, in the very end you are outputted with a markdown and a console output which will show you if there are any possible gaps in this whole translation process. So just to give an example in this slide here as you can see uh, this uh, is a rule which is created in SimGrip. This is a test case uh, it's in C. So what do we do is we run the OSN analyzer over this test case we run R rule which we have created simply for this test case and then we generate a GLSAS report in flow finder and simply and then we compare them and then we have a whole gap analysis report so here we're just taking an excerpt so it's for the excess function which is a known vulnerability in C code base so as you can see I mean it's really neat kind of thing for each finding you can see that this is the file where this uh, vulnerability was found the line number uh, whether it was found in the original analyzer or it was found in our analyzer and the corresponding rule uh, which we have created and all of that. So uh, this, so, and all these markdown reports for every analyzer which we translate the whole process, this all are shifted to uh, another project which we have been as a do testing starts. You can always click on the link and see. So this is the GI image which is, whole, is demonstrating you uh, how you can see. So. If you click on the link, you can see that this was the vulnerability. If you click on this link, you can see that, yes, this is the corresponding rule, which is identifying that vulnerability. So uh, that's great. And uh, these are the corresponding links to the project repositories. You can always click on them, have a look. And that was all about our project for this whole GSOC. Thank you very much for your time. If anybody has questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you, Anshuman and Julian. That was really, really informative really cool to see all the work compressed like this uh does anybody have quick questions i don't see everybody on the screen so it's, no. okay that's not no problem uh let's head on to our last presentation um shubham is he around yeah right yeah Uh, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Shubham Kumar and I'm working with the GEO team uh, this Google Summer of Code. And a little bit uh, about my journey at GitLab. I started contributing uh, at GitLab in February uh, when I was learning about Ruby and Rails. And then I also participated in GitLab Hackathon. 
and later on i also became a gitlab hero and applied for google summer of code and since now uh, so far i have i have uh, more than 20 merge request uh, merge so far and this uh, gsoc uh, our project is improvements to uh, backup and restore process so uh, i have a couple of tasks uh, which i did uh, in which the first one was adding the backup output blocks uh, this helped us uh, you know understanding the failures and providing support uh, faster and also uh, we had a temporary folder after restore which uh, you know gradually increasing the size and uh, people as having problem after you know uh, several restore so uh, we have to remove that temporary file and that helped us you know uh, reducing the unnecessary disk size after the restore process and the third one was to you know whenever uh, the backup is failed uh, we have to email the admin notifying them that uh, backup is failed uh, with the you know uh, what are the contents in it and the uh, path and the last task is still work in progress uh, we have to add the non compression mode uh, for the backup make, uh, for disabling the compression uh, so that it will be easier for the system to handle the duplication and i'll quickly show some demo taking a little bit of time. The idea behind uh, this task is to we have uh, a log file, a uh, JSON log file, which helps you know debugging the uh, process. We have a log file and we have something as a backup JSON log. This is the log file which will be generated after the backup creation. Uh, Shubham, if you have another demo to show as well, maybe we could just wait for yeah, yeah. the script to run yeah. the background. Yeah, I think maybe some uh, GDK issues I've been facing lately. Maybe I'll move to the uh, slide. And my experience, my mentor Gabriel and Akriti helped me a lot uh, uh, in this Google Summer Code. Uh, making this experience uh, awesome for me. Uh, they helped me a lot in uh, debugging and writing tests. So yeah, this was all about me. Thank you. Okay, looks like it's working. Yeah, so you can see that uh, this backup JSON log is populated with the data and the timestamp. And the uh, message also. Uh, 
uh, we also have uh, this backup file here. Now I'll attempt to restore this. Uh, this takes a little bit of time yeah. so uh, earlier we had a temp file inside this backup uh, that was uh, you know gradually uh, increasing the size unnecessary and it was having uh, a problem with the disk error disk full error so we had to remove that Yes, that's taking a bit of time too. Um, and uh, is this your last step where we get rid of yeah. the temp directories? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, are we done? Um, I think it is quite um, understandable. Yeah, it will take <laughs> it will take some time. So uh, we time. do not have the yeah temp yeah. directory in, inside the backups. All right. Cool. Um, I think that's that's cool. Um, it was really nice. I, the Geo team is really thankful for this project because these were issues that were really important to improve the backup process, which is used a lot and um, it was there, had to be done. It's great. Um, does anybody have any questions? Hey, I guess not. We are on time, which is great um thanks everybody for your presentations thanks for keeping time totally amazing um really had fun finally seeing what everyone was doing and uh as i said it's been a it's been kind of smooth everybody with the mentors and the mentees were really communicative everything was done on time and properly and it didn't seem like most of us were having our first experience here so that's amazing uh in the next two week uh, in the next two weeks, we uh, I think the interns will submit their work and uh, we all going to do evaluations. Um, but I think 31st August is really the hard deadline. So don't stress yourselves too much. A lot of nice work has already been done. Um, just try to wrap things up, relax a bit, ask us a lot of questions. We'd love to answer. And um, even after GSOC, keep in touch. And I hope uh, you enjoy contributing to the lab more. I hope we see you in more MRs. Uh, it's been really fun. And I see a couple of messages coming in. Um, thank you, Lucas. Uh, I'm glad everybody enjoyed uh, the demos. Oh, OK, I thought somebody shared the screen. Um, OK. So uh, what, one question for you, Kriti. Um, this is being recorded. Will uh everyone have access to that and how can we yes. I'm going that to, out? I'm going to put it up on uh, our YouTube channel and post a link in uh, our GSOC channel and also in the what's happening uh, in GitLab channel. So everybody has it. Okay. Um, okay, that's great. Uh, anybody else have questions, comments? Uh, I'd love to quietly clap. Okay, uh, well, thank you, everyone. This is super amazing. Um, let's wind this up and all the best to the interns and I hope we see you all more. Bye. Thank you.